Greetings, my friends in Caparica and around the world for the fourth International Splicing Conference. I'm very grateful uh, to Capello and uh, the organizing team for yet another wonderful meeting to be organized. And I'm looking forward to hearing all of the other talks. I'm very sorry I can't be in Portugal this year, just like last year, and very much look forward to joining you again next year uh, face to face when the opportunity presents. Today, I'm speaking about two of my favorite areas and joining them together. The first being intron retention and the second CTCF. And so I've slightly changed my title to make it uh, very up to date with some work that we've only just had uh, published uh, in the last couple of months. The title being CTCF and alternative splicing, look who joined the party. Uh, so uh, in um, the next slide, I've shown you these various controls of gene expression. And at the top of the trifle cake, I've shown intron retention because that's been an area of great interest to us over about the last eight years. And today I'm going to join uh, with a little bit of background review of intron retention, this concept with uh, one of our other favorite uh, aspects of gene expression uh, control, which is CTCF, and try and convince you that they are intimately related. Uh, but just to revise uh, where we have come from, uh, alternative splicing is a mechanism uh, which is very familiar to this audience, uh, a splicing conference, uh, which is a mechanism by which uh, our complexity is added uh, to genomic expression of individual genes. And as you know, there are multiple different mechanisms by which alternative splicing is achieved, uh, exon skipping, mutually exclusive exons, uh, alternative use of splice sites, and then the poor cousin of uh, all of these uh, different mechanisms, which is intron retention, uh, the least understood form of alternative splicing and the least studied, but one that we believe is of great importance partly because it is a mechanism that we believe is independent of other mechanisms as it traditionally triggers nonsense mediated decay uh, because of the presence of stop codon codons within introns. We first became particularly interested in intron retention uh, when we uh, described this mechanism uh, in differentiation of white blood cells, in particular human and mouse neutrophils or granulocytes during the promyelocyte to myelocyte to granulocyte phases of uh, differentiation of these particular white blood cells. Being a hematologist, this was an obvious area that we were particularly interested in. And what we showed back then is that in normal granulopoiesis, in normal granulocyte differentiation, there is an increasing intron retention occurring in transcripts, which leads to, in the main, nonsense mediated decay through specific mechanisms. And this was published now eight years ago uh, in what became uh, quite a highly cited paper in Cell. Now, when we explored uh, granulopoiesis, we were very specific in studying those mechanisms. But what we wanted to do was to see whether or not it was more broadly applicable as a physiological mechanism that applied to all aspects of blood cell development and indeed beyond. And, in, and that's what we have sought to do over a number of years now in this hierarchical representation of blood cell development from the top of uh, blood stem cells all the way to the lower levels of the differentiated cell types. We have now uh, had the opportunity to study granulopoiesis leading to neutrophils or granulocytes uh, shown here in that first uh, lineage, but also extended that to red blood cell or erythroid differentiation, megakaryocyte differentiation, and most recently in the monocyte macrophage differentiation of white blood cells in the innate immune system. Uh, these works have been published uh, uh, both in collaboration uh, with various other laboratories and programs associated with our cells. And so I think we've established that intron retention is a fundamentally important mechanism involved in a blood cell development. Uh, indeed, uh, some of the bioinformatic tools that we used and developed in order to demonstrate this previously did not, not exist. And uh, tools such as IR Finder, uh, or uh, more recently, uh, a number of different uh, tools that are available on our website uh, show that uh, intron retention is indeed a mechanism affecting all of the different blood cell lineages. But even beyond that, we sought to explore whether or not it is a widely applicable mechanism during all of mammalian 
uh, white cell development. And in order to do that, we obtained these same granular sites in five different species, a human, mouse, dog, chicken, and zebrafish. And then we did very deep RNA-seq and bioinformatics analysis to demonstrate that the percentage of genes affected by intron retention shown in this histogram. And as you can see, it varies between 7% uh, in zebrafish and as high as 40% of all genes are affected by introns, uh, intron retention in chickens. And that was work published by Ulf Schmitz uh, in our laboratory uh, some four years ago. Indeed, when we looked at the commonality of genes affected by intron retention in these five different species in their granular sites, we could show that there were 86 genes common to each one of those species which retained introns, suggesting this is a highly conserved mechanism through, throughout 400 million years of evolution. Moreover, we were really struck when we uh, plotted the number of protein coding genes shown here on the x-axis against the fraction of intron retaining genes, demonstrating quite a striking linear relationship between the number of protein coding genes and the fraction of intron retaining genes, suggesting to us that this is a fundamentally conserved mechanism by which gene regulatory complexity in vertebrates is exhibited, such that the higher the number of protein coding genes, the less number of uh, intron retaining genes, because one complements the other, one uh, in a sense uh, reflects the inverse of the other. We went further to not only demonstrate that intron retention was conserved in evolution, but also that there are epigenetic mechanisms by which intron retention is occurring. And in two papers, uh, one uh, in collaboration with Andras Naj in Nature and more recently in Nature Communications, we were able to dissect the epigenetic mechanisms, which we focused uh, by, uh, on mechanisms involving methylation and differential methylation uh, and ultimately binding of gene, uh, proteins such as MECP2 and TRA2B, which modulate the ability of RNA pole uh, uh, to uh, trans, uh, transcribe uh, the genome and then ultimately lead to uh, intron retention as opposed to the constitutive mechanisms by which introns are typically excised. Indeed, Geoffrey Montus in our laboratory was able to review a whole hierarchy of mechanisms by which intron retention is regulated. And these are represented here, and you can go to this review in nucleic acids research we published now a couple of years ago, showing that the intron retention is regulated at uh, the histone and DNA levels of uh, nucleosome occupancy and uh, acetylated histones, but also at the DNA pre-mRNA and mature mRNA levels, uh, each of which has their own specific aspects that modulate intron retention. But now I want to switch gears and introduce a new player in the alternative splicing arena, which is a gene that we have studied now for many, many years called CTCF. CTCF is a ubiquitously expressed protein uh, which uh, is involved in embryogenesis, uh, but is also uh, uh, particularly known as a master weaver of the genome, which we now know it does in tandem with cohesin at the basis of topologically associated domains in terms of chromatin organization. But for decades now, CTCF has been recognized as fundamentally involved in gene expression, whether it be activation or, or repression of gene expression, and indeed epigenetic regulation through a differential methylation binding. On the right-hand side, I've summarized a number of different uh, um, uh, publications that we have described that uh, are uh, uh, involving tumor suppression via CTCF, development uh, via CTCF, and most recently, alternative splicing of CTCF, uh, but rather alternative splicing by which CTCF uh, uh, modulates different isoform selection. And that's where we're going to focus our attention for the remainder of the talk today. Um, in order to do that, I want to highlight the work of a very gifted PhD student in our laboratory, uh, Adil Alabi from Saudi Arabia, and his particular experiment that I'm going to describe today is to examine transcriptome-wide effects of CTCF dose dependency in regulating alternative splicing in vivo. And in order to do that, we took a favorite mouse model of ours, which is the CTCF uh, nullozygous mouse model. 
Now, CTCF, when now, is embryonic lethal because it's ubiquitously expressed, and we know that cells can only survive one or two cell divisions based on the residual amount of protein after which cells die. In the heterozygous mice, uh, we know that these mice uh, feature spontaneous tumour formation when they are moderately aged, uh, and this is part, partly contributed to by aberrant DNA hypermethylation. But these uh, CTCF heterozygous mice are born in a Mendelian manner, and we're able to collect tissues from these mice, and that's exactly what we did uh, from brain, kidney, liver, muscle, and spleen in order to do very deep RNA sequencing analysis to study differential gene expression and differential alternative splicing. And so we compared in all of these experiments wild type mice to CTCF heterozygous mice and these different tissues. And the first thing we wanted to do was to determine whether or not there was indeed heterozygosity reflected in the transcript uh, of CTCF and in the protein of CTCF. And this is quantitation uh, by uh, deep sequencing uh, and also QRT-PCR compared to um, uh, protein uh, assays by Western blotting in all of those five different tissues compared to control, demonstrating there's approximately a 50% reduction in the levels of RNA and protein of CTCF in each one of these different tissues. Now we wanted to ask whether or not there is tissue specific differential expression of genes in these tissues. And as you can see, uh, yes, indeed, uh, that, that is exactly what we demonstrated. And in the heterozygous mice, on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see that there are a number of genes that are common to each of these five different tissues, which are differentially expressed. And in the middle of the, of the convergence of these five different tissues is uh, seven different genes each of which are modulated in each of, of these uh, tissues. And you can see uh, quite uh, uh, reasonably that CTCF is knocked down in each one of these tissues compared to control. But interestingly, some genes are up, some genes are down, but the commonality of all of those genes in each one of those five tissues, we think, points to the fact that CTCF is ubiquitously expressed and central to gene expression in many different tissues. Now, going further in analyzing these differentially expressed genes, we wanted to see what were the mechanisms of alternative splicing in these genes. And here, here are the four familiar different uh, mechanisms by which alternative splicing is achieved. And now when we studied each one of those tissues, looking at the alternative isoforms that were expressed in the very deep sequencing that were performed in each of these tissues. You can uh, focus your attention, first of all, on what is uh, most commonly seen as a differential expression uh, uh, and an alternative uh, isoform in, in the form of exon skipping shown in the, in the green circles. And you can see uh, in each one of the different five tissues, there was no significant difference between uh, the different tissues in the heterozygous CTCF mice compared to control for exon skipping. But now I would draw your attention to the red uh, uh, circles uh, that you may have already uh, seen, highlighting intron retention, which is significantly increased in the heterozygous CTCF mice just in the kidney and liver, a beautifully controlled experiment. And as you can see, that was not observed in brain, muscle or spleen. Now asking the question, what were the genes that were affected by this intron retention in kidney and liver? You can see that there was an enrichment in the gene ontology and keg pathway analysis for RNA splicing and processing and spliceosomal genes, suggesting that this was a mechanism by which this intron retention may have been implicated. In addition, uh, you can see that there was a mechanism uh, uh, that we wanted to study, which was, okay, is it CTCF somehow directly uh, implicated in this modulation of gene expression? And in order to do that, we wanted to look to see whether or not uh, CTCF was differentially binding to the retained introns versus the non-retained introns in terms of the body of the introns themselves or 50 kb. Uh, upstream or 50 kb downstream of differentially retained introns compared to non-retained introns. And to do that, we did analysis of normal uh, mouse chip seek data that had been previously published. And now focusing on the non-retained and retained introns within the intron body, you can see that there was no difference in CTCF binding sites as determined by chip seek. 
But now when we looked 50 kb upstream or downstream, we started to see a striking difference and the enrichment of CTCF binding in the upstream region of these differentially retained uh, 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 genes. And this was specifically uh, uh, in genes uh, within uh, exons, intergenic regions and introns, suggesting this was the location uh, of the genes upstream of these differentially retained introns that was affecting this. And maybe this was involved in chromatin organization or directly involved in CTCF's ability to activate gene expression and alter RNA pole uh, uh, processivity. Nonetheless, this was a striking uh, uh, reinforcement of the fact that there is enrichment of CTCF binding sites proximal to differentially retained gene expression, leading to a model that we were able to postulate uh, that uh, CTCF haploinsufficiency was impl implicated in inducing intron retention through various mechanisms, possibly involving methylation and RNA pol 2 processivity in terms of its effects on the spicosome and indeed leading to intron retention. This work is now published in RNA biology only a few months ago, and you can read the details with um, much more elaborate um, information uh, present in the paper. But now taking a more broad view as to the mechanisms by which CTCF might mediate all alternative splicing, we've recently had an opportunity to review the literature and place our work in the context of other publications. And looking at the center of this target uh, uh, here, you can see that we uh, believe now that CTCF is very much central to mediating alternative splicing at many different levels. Those three fold levels being co-transcriptional, genomic and epigenetic. Uh, and there are the mechanisms around the edge of the target uh, detailing those three different main, different main mechanisms by which CTCF may modulate alternative splicing, be they proven mechanisms or hypothetical mechanisms that are emerging uh, uh, of control elements. And indeed, uh, we had the opportunity to review the CTCF mediated co-transcription or regulation of alternative splicing. Three levels of uh, co-transcription or regulation shown here, be they RNA elongation rate, uh, downstream interaction through PARP and CTCF uh, uh, mechanisms uh, mediated through DNMT1 uh, involving methylation. And finally, splicing factor recruitment uh, uh, on the, uh, the effects being on nascent pre-mRNAs uh, leading to alternative splicing mechanisms. In terms of genomic and epigenetic regulation for which CTCF uh, partnered with cohesin is very famous, you can see three different hierarchical mechanisms also shown here at the top. Uh, CTCF uh, binding topologically associated domain bases uh, in the middle, uh, SWI SNF uh, mechanisms involving uh, histone acetylation, uh, and finally, RE, uh, the final uh, level there being uh, RNA pole uh, differential binding through differential methylation. This work has been summarized in a paper only just published this month uh, in Nucleic Acids Research, which places CTCF at the center as a regulator of alternative splicing, new tricks for an old player, and now CTCF really is joining the party. So I want to acknowledge uh, the group of individuals very gifted uh, who participated in this work. Adele Alabi uh, did his PhD in this area, Charles Bailey uh, central to the work on all CTCF, uh, and Ulf Schmitz I want to highlight does all of the bioinformatics over many years in our lab and has now started his own laboratory north uh, in Australia at, at uh, James Cook University and Ulf will be giving a talk on Thursday uh, during this uh, conference. Uh, in addition to the flannel day uh, apparel uh, that has been worn here, sometimes we wear uh, summer wear and sometimes a winter wear, of course, uh, at the, in the southern hemisphere at the moment, we're still in the colder months uh, and I'm very jealous of you in the northern hemisphere uh, being in summertime. Uh, I will conclude uh, by, by uh, showing uh, the slide uh, to acknowledge uh, the work of the uh, individuals who've, who've uh, been involved in my lab uh, as shown uh, here in the broader group. Uh, we would love you to join us down under sometime soon and uh, study CTCF and alternative splicing as this now emerges as an important area by which splicing uh, modulation can be achieved. I thank you for your attention. And then again, I uh, thank you for inviting me to join you and we'll look forward to uh, um, uh, hearing the other talks during the remainder of the of the uh, 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 conference. Thanks very much.